This is part three. Now, the very first night I was here and we talked about the myth that science slams creation or creation story and science kind of butt heads. They do not. The truth is science, especially scientific law and the Bible creation story actually mesh. There's not one scientific law that contradicts the Bible or the Bible does not contradict any of the scientific laws. But now there are some theories that do butt heads with the Bible or the creation story. An example would be evolution, the theory of evolution and the Big Bang. The Bible is very clear. God created the heavens and the earth in six days. Now, what we did was we just looked at science. We looked at the laws. We looked at the theories that first time around. And then we looked at the creation story. I want to make it also clear that uh, in the world we live in, it may look old. And it is. But God created it aged around 6,000 years years ago. Now the second night Dr. Spomer was here and he talked to you about the Bible and the myth is that it's just an ordinary book like many others. It is not. It is an extraordinary book. It has 66 books in one. It has an Old Testament and a New Testament. It was written over a period of 1600 years by 40 different people but one plan of salvation. I don't know if Dr. Spomer talked to you about this last week, but if I sent all of you home and said, go write a book on any topic you want, and you'd all come back a week later, I think we'd have many different topics. Imagine a span of 1,600 years. And all those books come together, and one plan of salvation through Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior. Another thing that makes the Bible so unique is prophecy. No other book on earth has as many prophecies or even comparably any prophecies. The Bible has over 300 prophecies, and they're all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Tonight, part three, we're going to take a close look. Everybody should have a handout, right? Anybody need a handout? A pen? Pencil? All right. The golden rule is all that matters. Okay? The truth we're going to take a look at tonight is loving God and following the golden rule is what matters. Would you open your Bibles with me to Matthew 7? Matthew 7. The Bible, you know, records what is known as the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do to yourself. Matthew 7, verse 12, found on page 1032. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Is the golden rule found in the Bible? Yes. But the myth that is out there is that's all I need to worry about. As long as I haven't killed anybody, as long as I haven't knocked off a bank, I'm going to be okay. I'll take my chances. And uh, I will take my chances because I've been following the golden rule most of my life. Well, the Bible has something else to say. So if you would turn with me to Matthew 22, a little farther to the right of Matthew 7. Matthew 22, 34. Matthew 22, 34. To 34, I mean, beginning with verse 34. 
But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. You notice how it says, love the Lord your God with all your body, all your soul, and your, all your mind. We are triune. That first week I spoke to you about creation. The Bible clearly states that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit created the heavens and the earth. And everything in creation is triune. We looked at water, H2O. It takes three atoms to make up the molecule water. We looked up, uh, we talked about mass. All of mass is made up of protons, electrons, and neutrons. Everything on earth, all of creation is triune. God is triune, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he created us in his image. And we have a body, soul, and mind. And we are to love first God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind. And then love our neighbor as ourself. These two things are important. The way it's written, love God and follow the golden rule is all that matters. Open now your Bibles or turn your Bibles to Acts 16. A wonderful little story about the history of the early church. Acts 16, beginning with verse 25. It's a story about a jailer who is guarding Paul and Silas, and a, a strange event takes place. And he asks that one question that whether you admit it or not, I believe everybody sometime in their life, will ask this question. They may never vocalize it, maybe internally they ask this question. Acts 16, beginning with verse 25, page 1177. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone, everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. And the reason he's going to kill himself is because he thought all the prisoners were gone and that he was going to be killed because if you're the jailer and the prisoners escape, you're held accountable, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer, jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's that one question I believe everybody eventually in their life either thinks about or asks this question. What must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved and your household. And they spoke the words of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them that same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all of his family. So here is a gentleman who's fearful, worried about the end of his life. He was almost ready to commit suicide. And Paul and Silas did not leave, and he asks that question, what must I do to be saved? Let me ask you a question here tonight. If you die tonight, would you go to heaven? Just think about that. If you died tonight, 
would you go to heaven? Or do you also have a question maybe filtering in your mind? What must I do to be saved? Well, let's dig a little deeper into why we need to be saved. Let's go back to the very beginning. Open up your Bibles to Genesis with me, please. Now, the first week we're here, we looked at the creation story. Each day of creation. We didn't have the time, but I'm going to take you up to speed what happened on the sixth day of creation. God created Adam and Eve and put them in the Garden of Eden. Now, the Garden of Eden was a self-sustaining garden. It had all the fruits and the vegetables anybody could enjoy. But in the middle of the garden, or at least someplace in the garden, God placed two trees. One was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the other was the tree of life. And the only command that God gave Adam and Eve was, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, some people want to know, why did God put those trees in the first place in the garden? Think about that. You got this beautiful garden. You got Adam and Eve in the garden And then he placed these two trees, one of knowledge of good and evil and the one of life. Does anybody here think they know why God put those trees in the garden? (laughs) I'm going to tell you, you may disagree, but that's all right. Because he loved them. True love always entails a choice. I don't think anybody here had a shotgun at their back when they got married. Okay? Bobby, you didn't, did you? Yes, I did. <laughs> yes, you did. Yeah. But uh, if somebody forces you to love them, is that true love? No, true love always entails a choice. That's why we marry the love of our life or the person we choose to love. God did not want to create puppets out of Adam and Eve, so he gave them the choice and said, you're free to make any choice you want, but if you make a certain choice, there are consequences. Now, we're going to pick up the story after Adam and Eve are in the garden for some time. They are married. The first couple to be married are Adam and Eve, and the first recorded marriage in all of uh, literature, you might say, is the biblical marriage of Adam and Eve in the garden. We pick it up soon after they are married and after they're in the garden, and most people believe not for a very long time, and we're going to pick up what is called the fall, chapter 3, On page 3, if you're using the Bible that we provided for you. I'm just going to pick up the story, and let's take a look at what happens. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Now, the serpent in this story is the devil, okay? Sometime between the creation of the world, Adam and Eve being married, placed in the garden, and this event called the fall, one of God's most decorated angels fell from grace. He sinned. His name was Lucifer, okay? And we know that because in the beginning of the Bible, we hear about him, but we also hear about him throughout the Bible. In fact, I'm now going to ask you, put your finger here and just turn to the book of Revelation with me, please. Chapter 12. Revelation 12. Beginning with verse 7, okay? Now, this is the last book of the Bible. 
And it's kind of interesting. If you want to know about the first book in the Bible, you have to go to the last book in the Bible. Scripture interprets Scripture. It's an incredible book that uh, gives us the complete story. 1319, that's the page number. 12, beginning with verse 7. Now war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil, and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. Now, if you have your own Bible, you might want to underline that. That's what the devil wants to do in our life, deceive us. Okay, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Okay? Now, what happened was the devil sinned and his angels, they are not forgiven. They're thrown down to earth. Now, the devil roams the earth and he wants to deceive people. And we see him first appearing in the Garden of Eden. He's trying to deceive Adam and Eve. And at the same time, he does this to each and every one of us. Let's go back to Genesis and pick up the story. Just a little side note so we understand who Satan is, who is the devil. He's a fallen angel. Okay? Picking up the story. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? So what we're looking at is the fall. In the beginning, there was Adam, there was Eve, and there was the devil. Okay? Who? Who was involved in the fall? Adam and Eve and the devil. Okay? He said to the woman, Did God actually say to you, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Now notice this. The woman knows Scripture. The woman knows what God said. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of any fruit of the tree in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat Of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, what's rather interesting here is God said this. You're free to eat of any tree, but that tree don't eat from. The day you eat from it, you shall surely die. Now, the woman adds a law to it. (laughs) What's interesting is we like adding laws to God's laws. She said, well... Yes, God said, you must not eat of any tree, of this tree, because if you eat of it, or if you touch it, you shall surely die. God said nothing about touching it, just eating it. You know, it's interesting, we have ten commandments in the Bible. When the Pharisees and the scribes walked on earth, they had 613 laws. (laughs) Any Christian church in town, we all follow basically the Ten Commandments. But you go to any church, and there's going to be a lot of rules and regulations, okay? An example would be some churches will say, you can't dance. (laughs) Some churches will say, you can't have any music, you know, instruments, okay? There are so many rules and regulations. We see Eve, from the very beginning, adding 100% more to the command of God. Not only eat it, but you can't even touch it. And uh, this indication is kind of like, hmm, really? So the devil is trying to create doubt in the life of Adam and Eve. Did God really say? Let's pick up the story. Verse 3, uh, verse 4. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Now the serpent is contradicting God's word. God said, you shall surely die. So what does the devil want to do in our life? The first thing the devil wants to do is create doubt. The second thing the devil wants to do, okay, is contradict the Bible, okay? God's word. Verse 5, now he throws out his own promise, For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, 
and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the first thing the devil does is create doubt. The second thing the devil does is contradict God's word. The third thing the devil does is make a false promise. You will be like God. You won't even need him anymore. So did God really say? Let me give you another example how the devil does this. Did God really say you shouldn't steal from your employer? Did God really say you shouldn't commit adultery? No, God didn't say you can't steal. God did not say you can't commit adultery. That's just man's interpretation. For the day you commit adultery, you will be set free. The day you steal from your employer, you will have more money. The devil uses the same technique today as he did 6,000 years ago in the Garden of Eden. Let's continue with the story. Verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. <laughs> now this is the first place in the Bible where women get a bad rap. Okay? And the reason women get a bad rap is because men interpret this Okay, like this. And the woman saw the fruit in the tree, and she took it, and she ate it. And then she bent her husband's arm behind his back, oh, and when he opened his mouth to scream, ouch, she shoved it in his mouth, and he was forced to eat it. <laughs> That's how a man reads it, okay? <laughs> Let me tell you how the Bible reads. She ate of it and gave some to her husband, for he was right there with her. Okay? Probably the cutest little cartoon I'd ever seen was the backside of a pudgy, naked Adam and Eve. Adam on the bottom, Eve on the top, you know. He's holding her up, and she's reaching for the fruit. Okay? <laughs> Both of them were there. Both of them ate from it. It wasn't the woman's fault. It was both their fault, okay? But she was the first one, and then he ate of it, okay? Once again, let's pick up the story, okay? We're looking at the fall of mankind. Who? Adam and Eve and the devil from the beginning. When? In the beginning, at the creation, right after creation, okay? How did the fall come about? The temptation of the devil, okay? The temptation of the devil. Now we're going to take a look at the outcome. Of course, the outcome of the fall is disobeying God, and when you disobey God, there's consequences. Let's take a look at the consequences. Oh, before we move on, let me, if I may, paraphrase verse 6. You ready? So when the man saw that alcohol was good for food and that it was a delight on a Friday night and that the alcohol was to be desired, he took as much as he could and drank it and shared it with his friends. Let me give another one. When the college student saw that drugs, okay, were desirable to make one wise, that college student took of the drugs and swallowed it and gave some to her friends or his friends. When the high school student saw that marijuana was desirable for gaining a good time and laughing a lot and enjoying food. That high school student smoked the marijuana and shared it with her friends. Here's another one that we probably all can relate to. And so 
when the adult saw that a credit card was desirable for going out to eat and buying things at the store, that adult put the credit card down and spent as much as he could, not worrying about the debt, and gave that credit card to her husband or to his wife, and they spent as much as they desired. Hmm. Hopefully you can relate a little bit to how the devil works even today. Okay, He wants us to be deceived that God really doesn't have some rules and regulations for us to follow to keep life, you know, good for us. And then he always throws out a lie. Let's look at the outcome, some of the consequences, okay? Verse 8, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. God, among the trees in the garden. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed verse 7. My fault. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. The first outcome of sin is shame. Now, prior to this, Adam and Eve were in the garden. They were naked. And when they sinned, they looked at themselves and they realized they were naked and they were ashamed of themselves and they sewed fig leaves together to make loincloths. Now, I want you to think about a sin that you've committed. Now, you don't have to raise your hand and tell me, Taylor, okay? You don't have to do that, all right? <laughs> I want you to think of a really bad sin you've committed, okay? One of the first things that's going to happen is shame. You know, oh, I can't believe I did that. Oh, I hope nobody finds out about this. And you feel kind of naked that you've committed this sin, whatever that is. Now, that's a consequence that God instills in all of us because of sin. And you feel naked and you want to, Cover yourself. Now, in the Hebrew term, you're going to love this, the Hebrew term for covering, okay, Adam and Eve sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. The Hebrew term is forgiveness. They wanted to forgive themselves. They wanted to get it over with and cover themselves. So the first consequence of sin is shame, okay? Now, verse 8, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. Here was Adam and Eve who walked with God in the cool of the day all the time. It was Adam and Eve and God in the garden, okay, enjoying life. And all of a sudden, the devil comes into this picture, tempts them, they sin. Now, fear is the second consequence of sin. You know, the outcome is disobedience. What does disobedience cause? Shame and fear. They now fear the one who gave them life. They now fear the one who told them to not eat from that tree in the garden. Today, if you have children <laughs> and they disobey you, guess what? They'll run and hide, <laughs> okay? I raised five children, and it's amazing. Every one of them, when they sinned or did something wrong, I'd have to go looking for them, okay? No different with Adam and Eve in the garden. God goes looking for them. They heard the sound of the Lord God walk in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called to man and said to him, Where are you? Isn't it interesting? God goes looking for him. Where are you? Got a question for you. Do you think God knew where they were? <laughs> Absolutely. Then why would God say, Where are you? Hmm. Well, if you have children, you've done it before. Where are you? Okay. Uh, 
the reason God is asking is he wants Adam and Eve to grow up, step up, and say, here I am. See, that's the mature thing to do, <laughs> okay? To stand up, and he's, he's giving them a chance to confess, to buck up, to own up. Where are you? This is what Adam should have done. I'm here. I blew it. But he doesn't do that, okay? But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. I hid myself. So we got the shame. We got the fear, okay? And he said, Who told you that you were naked? <laughs> So here's God saying, second chance, who told you you were naked? <laughs> Where are you? Who told you you were naked? God is just, come on, Adam and Eve, take ownership. He said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to me to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate it. <laughs> oh, God just wants Adam to step up and say, I'm sorry, Lord, I disobeyed you. Where are you? Did you eat from that tree I commanded you not to eat of? And what does he do? He passes the buck. Okay, now this is the second place where women get a bad rap in the Bible. Okay, once again, this is how a man reads it. The woman you gave me, <laughs> she bent my arm back. Oh, it was terrible, Lord. She pulled it back, and when I, ah, uh, she shoved that apple in my mouth. <sighs> I want my rib back right now. <laughs> but that's not what he does, okay? Now think about it. The woman you gave me. That's not what he does. Watch this. The woman you gave me. He blames God. I didn't ask for her. You put me into a sleep and took my rib out. The woman you gave me, she gave me something to eat. He blames God. Well, isn't that what we do when things get a little tough in life? The job you gave me, the students you gave me, the husband you gave me, the children you gave me, this body you gave me, it's all your fault. Otherwise, I'd be perfect. <laughs> yeah. Deception at its finest. Blame the guy who's in charge, okay? Let's pick up the story. The man said, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. She learns very well from her husband. Pass that buck. Blame everybody else except yourself. <laughs> but it doesn't work. You can never say, the devil made me do it. It doesn't cut it with God, because God knows everything, okay? Maybe you've said that in the past, the devil made me do it, okay? Now, God wants us to say, I'm sorry, I did it. Forgive me. That's called confession of sin, and that's where God wants us. But now let's take a look at further outcome. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. Now what's interesting here in Genesis 3.15 God is making a statement to Adam and to Eve that, listen, there will be strife between mankind and the devil, but someday an offspring of Eve, singular, male offspring of Eve, will crush the devil's head, bruise the devil's head, and the devil will bruise his heel. Now, 
I know it may be hard to understand, but Adam and Eve in the garden 6,000 years ago just committed the first sin. And before God punishes them, I don't know about you, but when your children misbehave, okay, one of the first things I did was swat them (laughs) or punish them, okay? But not God. God makes a promise to them. Someday I'll take care of this. I'll fix it in the future. Eve, someday in the future, one of your descendants will take care of this problem called sin. And he looks to the future. Now, after making this promise, now he instills or ushers in the consequences for sin, other than shame, okay, and fear. Let's take a look. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Okay, so ladies, if you've ever given birth to a child and it was painful, you can thank Eve for that. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Once again, here's a place in Scripture where women get a bad rap, okay? The third time, because this is how a man reads this, okay? Your desire shall be for your husband, of course. Yes, your sexual desire will be for your husband, and he shall rule over you with a mighty thumb. And you must obey everything he says. (laughs) That's not what the Bible says. That's what man thinks. Okay? We know that Scripture interprets Scripture. What is said here and what Jesus says and what Paul says have to mesh. The desire of a woman for a man is to be respected, to be honored to be an equal, okay? The desire of a woman is to have a man who's willing to die for her, okay? And the reason we know this, because the example is Christ and his bride, the church, okay? Your desire will be for your husband to be an equal, to respect and honor you, okay? And he will rule over you. Here it is. The rule is the rule of love, okay? It's the rule of sacrifice, meaning the man for the woman should be the first to say, I'm sorry, the first to give in, the first to lay down his life for the woman. It's called the rule of love, where Christ so loved the church, okay? He laid down his life. And that's where man or the world tries to interpret the Bible and gets and uh, really messes it up. All right. Pain in childbearing, okay? Desire to be equal and respected by your husband, and he shall rule over you with love because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you. You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Guys, if you want to know why you got to put 40 hours in to get a paycheck or, you know, digging a ditch, you, you got to sweat, guess what? You can thank Adam and Eve for it because through the consequences of sin, we now have pain. We have toil. We have to work for a living. Thorns and thistles shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and dust you shall return. This is quoted almost every time at a funeral. When a pastor lays the mortal remains into the ground or an urn, into the ground, he says, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, in the name of the Father, the Son, 
and the Holy Spirit. Because the Bible is very clear. The day you eat of it, you shall surely die. You will turn to dust. Now, what's interesting is when God formed Adam, he formed Adam out of the dust of the ground. Now, the dust is, of the ground is just dirt. Scientifically, it's provable that all the minerals, all the atoms, all the molecules, everything that your body needs to become life is found in common dirt. Meaning, if I took a scoop of dirt, everything needed for your body is in that scoop of dirt. All the minerals, everything. <laughs> Pretty interesting, isn't it? So dust we came from, to dust we shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. So God forgave them. And then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat of it life forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground for which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword, so that turning every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So, another consequence, they lost the Garden of Eden. All right, where have we gone so far? The fall of man. Who, Adam and Eve in the garden? When, in the beginning, how through temptation, disobedience, and sin. Let's take a look at salvation. Turn with me to Acts 4. Acts 4. Acts 4, 10 through 12. So, we sinned, we have pain, we have suffering, we have to work for a living, we're going to die. Tell me some good news, Pastor Dreyer. Acts 4, beginning with verse 10, page 1160. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. We're looking at salvation now, the salvation of mankind. Who? Jesus. Now, there are a lot of religions in our world, and each religion has a plan of salvation, you might say. Like, you have to do A, B, and C to be saved. We're looking at Christianity. What is the plan of salvation in Christianity? Jesus. No other name given among men by which you are saved. Some of you probably have heard this before. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the story of Christianity. You see, the seed promised to Eve. 6,000 uh, 6, years ago, was the seed called Jesus. Jesus was born of woman. Okay? He is a descendant of Adam and Eve, no different than us. Okay? God became a man. That's what Christmas is all about, by the way. <laughs> it's called the incarnation of God. Born of a woman. Who? Jesus. When was this plan laid out? Turn with me to Matthew 25, 34, to the left. Matthew 25, 34. Matthew 25, 
34. These are the words of Jesus talking about the end of the world, his second coming. Jesus said these words, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Jesus is talking about the end of the world. He says, listen, there'll be a big white throne judgment. There'll be people on the right, people on the left. Some will go to hell, some will go to heaven. Then he explains, all this was from the creation of the world, the foundation. So when was God's plan of salvation set into place? From the beginning. So salvation, who? Jesus, no other person. When was this established? From the beginning. How am I saved from my sin, death, and the power of the devil to tempt me? Turn with me to Ephesians 2, 8, 9 now. To the right. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Now, a great theologian called this the crux of the Bible. And what does that mean? Meaning, if you understand this verse, the Bible opens up to you. If you don't understand this verse, it may be very difficult to understand the Bible. So he called this the crux of the Bible. Who said that? Martin Luther. Okay? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. It is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. This is a gift from God. Salvation is a gift from God. Faith is a gift from God. Now, what is grace? Grace is that undeserved love and forgiveness of God. I've used this story before, and I'm going to use it again. I'm going to use Bobby here. Bobby dies and goes before the pearly gates, and there's St. Peter. And St. Peter says, Bobby! we've been waiting for you. And Bobby walks up to St. Peter before the pearly gates and says, I've been waiting too. And St. Peter goes, well, Bobby, let me tell you the rules up here. You've got to have 2,000 points to get into heaven. And Bobby scratches his head and goes, what, 2,000 points? What do you mean? Nobody told me. About it. Pastor Dreyer didn't tell me about 2,000 points to get into heaven. Well, I don't care what Pastor Dreyer told you. Bobby, you want to get into heaven, you need 2,000 points. Well, tell me about the two, th you know, how do I get points, Bobby said. And he said, tell me the good things you did on earth, and I'll add up the points. And Bobby goes, well, I was married to Nancy for 50 years, and I was faithful to her, and I, you know, I didn't commit adultery. And St. Peter goes, all right, Bobby, that's pretty good. That, that's worth 10 points up here in heaven. And tell me some more. And Bobby goes, well, I, I was an usher at uh, Church on the Move and at a blaze for uh, 40 years. I served the Lord as an usher, and I did all these things. And St. Peter goes, yeah, that's right here in the book. Yeah, yeah, that's worth 10 points too, Bobby. Tell me some more. And Bobby's going, wait a minute, okay? A, a faithful husband. I taught, you know, I was an usher. Okay, I went to church every Sunday, St. Peter. The only time I missed church was, you know, if somebody died or I was sick. And St. Peter goes, yep, Bobby, that's right here. And that's worth 15 points. And uh, St. Peter says, Bobby, do me a favor. Say, Would you get to the big stuff? And Bobby's up there in heaven, and he, he kicks the rock and says, gosh, not even by the grace of God will I get into heaven. And St. Peter says, what did you say, Bobby? Bobby goes, well, not even by the grace of God will I get into heaven. And St. Peter says, grace? Why didn't you mention that, Bobby? That's worth 2,000 points here in heaven. Come on in. <laughs> uh, yeah. You see, there's nothing you can do in life where God's going to go, wow, you're so wonderful. 
Okay? That's why the Bible said, it is by grace through faith you are saved, not of works. This is a gift from God, lest any man should boast. How does anybody get to heaven? By grace, undeserved love. Okay? How are we saved? Through Jesus. Okay? When was this set into play? From the beginning. How? By grace, through faith. Okay. Let's take a look at the outcome. Okay? Turn with me to John 14. John 14. My goal in this class is just to make it perfectly clear to you in this class that it's not what you do. It's not if you follow the golden rule that is going to get you into heaven. No. Loving God with all your heart, all your soul, and your mind, and loving your neighbor as yourself. This is what God puts in our heart. Salvation comes from the inside out, not the outside in. Let's take a look at John 14, beginning with verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. Would I have told you I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to to myself, that where I am you may be also, and you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? Lord, if you're going to heaven, we don't know the way to get there. Make it clear. How do we get to heaven? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. For now on, you do know him and have seen him. Here is Jesus saying, I and the Father are one. But if anybody wants to go to heaven, if anybody wants to go to that Garden of Eden called heaven, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. There's no other way. Okay, It is by grace, through faith, that you are saved. The Bible also tells us, He that believeth and is baptized will be saved. Now, another night we'll be talking about baptism. But what I want to make clear to you, that according to the Bible, there is only one way to heaven. And it's not the golden rule. It's through faith. Jesus. All right, let's take a look at Mark 10. Would you please turn to Mark 10? There's two approaches to Jesus in life, okay? Two ways you can view Jesus. Mark 10, 15. Ex- yep. Number one, truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. There's two things that you can do. You can receive salvation. You can receive heaven. You can receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Meaning, if salvation is a gift and God gives it, all you can do is receive it. You know, at Christmas time, you receive gifts. At Christmas, the first Christmas, we received on earth Jesus Christ. Okay? You can either receive the gift or reject it. Turn with me to Mark, excuse me, John 12, 48. John 12, 48. If I'm going a little fast, I apologize. If you can't keep up, I'll read the scriptures. John 12, 48. 48. Jesus makes it very clear. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. So you can either receive the grace 
and salvation and forgiveness from Jesus, who is the only way, the truth, and the life, or you can reject it and say, don't need it. I'll get there on my own. Okay? Now turn with me to Luke 23. Luke 23. Luke 23. This is uh, at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Luke 23. I'm going to read verse 32, then pick it up on verse 39. Page 1124. Luke 23, 32. Two others, two other criminals were led away to be put to death with him. That is Jesus. Jump down to 39. One of the criminals who was hanged rallied at him saying, Are you not the Christ, the Messiah, the one promised to Adam and Eve? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, Do you not fear God? <laughs> Meaning he looked at Jesus and knew Jesus was God Almighty on earth. Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed justly, and we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, that is Jesus, said to that thief, truly I say to you today, you'll be with me in paradise. Imagine dying on a cross and hearing those words, today you'll be with me in paradise. This is... The crucifixion of Jesus Christ, there was a thief on his right and on his left. It represents the entire world. Everybody on earth is either on the right or the left side of Jesus. We talked about the white throne judgment. There will be people on the right and the left. But the crucifixion of Jesus represents the entire world. Every man, woman, and child on earth. Jesus is always in the middle. And how you see Jesus and how you receive Jesus will dictate whether you go to paradise or not. One thief, okay, looks at Jesus and mocks him. Well, if you are the Christ, <laughs> obviously not, then save us. He's thinking about himself. You know, please save me. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. Let's get down from this cross. The other thief looks at that one and says, do you not fear God? And he confesses his sin. We're guilty. We deserve punishment. We deserve death. We have eaten from the forbidden fruit. We have broke the Ten Commandments. We deserve to die, but not this man. This man is innocent. And then he looked at Jesus, and he said, Jesus, please just remember me. And look at what he receives in return. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. Because how did he get to heaven? Through Jesus. Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. So that thief on the cross is in paradise with Jesus. All human beings, everybody on earth, will either be on the left or the right side of Jesus. They'll either be in a place that's not heaven or heaven. You can either receive what Jesus gives or you can reject it. If you're willing to receive it, Okay, that's called believing. Okay, heaven is a gift, faith is a gift, forgiveness is a gift, everything that, your life is a gift, God gave it to you. Your children are gifts, God gave them to you. Everything you have in life is a gift from God. You can receive it or you can reject it. You can say, thank you, or you can say, I don't want it. Let's take a closer look at the story of Jesus. What time do we have? I want to know. Okay, we got a few minutes. I want to tell you two quick stories. There once was a, a father who at Christmas time never went to church with his wife and their two children. Christmas time, mom would buckle up the kids because it's winter time and head off for church for the Christmas Eve service. And she'd always turn to her husband, would you please go to church with us? No, I'm not going to church. Why won't you go to church? I can't believe in a God who would become a man and be crucified. That's just ridiculous. 
Okay. She'd load the kids up and off to church they would go. It was in the evening. It was snowing. He gets his popcorn, goes, sits down in his lounge chair, turns on the television, looks outside. It's snowing. Okay. And all of a sudden he hears a thud at the window. Puts his popcorn down and looks over to the window and and he sees a bird that was in the snow fluttering around. The bird tried to get through the window, hit it, and fell. And it was knocked out a little bit, but then that bird wrecked its, rectified itself and flew off to the tree. And in the tree, there were all these birds. And as he stood there, he thought, you know, those birds are pretty cold. <laughs> he went, put his overcoat on, his boots on, went out to the barn, opened up the barn door, turned on the light, looked up at those birds and said, come on, birds, the barn is warm. It's open for you. And the birds just looked at him. He said, come on, birds, there's grain in the barn. There's food in there. Come on. They just looked at him. So he went in the barn, grabbed a broom, and went over to the tree and started shooing the birds to get into the barn. And they just flew from one tree to another tree. And he went over to that tree and he went, come on, birds, get in the barn, you dummies. Come on, the door is open. And he went this way and he went that way. And he went back and forth because they just went from one tree to the other. And he wore himself out. And finally, leaning up against the broom, he said, I wish I could become a bird. Should I could tell these birds and lead them to the barn and to the safety And at that very moment, the church bells rang, celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ, God becoming a man to show man the way and be the way to salvation. And at that very moment, he realized why God had to become a man to show us the way and be our guide and be our salvation. Christmas is about the birth of Christ. That was planned from the very beginning. Jesus came to earth to die. Die for our sins. A price had to be paid. Only divine blood could pay the price of the sins of the world. We need to know that. We need to have faith in that. And we need to trust Jesus That's his plan of salvation. Anybody here ever been to Niagara Falls? Okay. I've been there once, and I plan to go again in June. (laughs) Okay. Uh, The deafening sound. But there's a wonderful story about a tightrope walker who uh, a bunch of people gathered, and he walked literally across Niagara Falls on a tightrope. Okay, now imagine if we're all watching this and he he goes all the way across and turns around and comes all the way back. And he looked at all of us and says, do you know that I can walk across this tight rope? And we're all going, yeah, we know that. He says, do you have faith? The Bible says this, faith is being certain of the things we can't see, sure of what we don't know. Meaning, if he said, now listen, do you think I can take up the bar that I've gone across with and throw it down and go all the way across? And we're going, well, we know you can do it, but we have faith that if you throw the bar down, you can. And so he goes across without the bar, comes back. So we have knowledge And we have faith that this guy's pretty good. And he says, what if I take a wheelbarrow? And we're going, well, we know you can do it. And we have faith. Faith is certain of the things we can't see. Meaning, how do we know there's a heaven? Have we ever seen it? No, but we have faith. Okay, how do we know there's going to be a tomorrow? We have faith, (laughs) okay? We know there was a yesterday, today, there is a tomorrow. So, How are we saved? We have to have knowledge, okay? So this guy says, how about if I have a wheelbarrow? You think I can go? And we're going. We know you can do it, and we have faith. So he takes the wheelbarrow, 
goes over Niagara Falls and comes back, and by this time we're going, oh, this guy's good, yeah. He says, okay, do you think I can put 100 pounds of weight in this wheelbarrow, bricks, and go across this tightrope and come back? And then we're going, we know you can, and we have faith you can. He says, ah, right. puts in 100 pounds, goes across, turns around, and he comes back. And we're just clapping. Wow, this guy is good. <laughs> then he says, I tell you what, dumps out those bricks, 100 pounds of weight. He says, do you think I can put a person in this wheelbarrow and go all the way across Niagara Falls and come back? And we're all going, we know you can. We have faith you can. Sure, go ahead. And he looks at us and he says, who's going to get in? That's called trust. <laughs> what does it mean to believe? You got to have a knowledge. You got to have knowledge that there is a creator of heaven and earth and that he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ. You got to know that. You have to have faith that he's your only way to heaven, a place you haven't even seen. But this is the most difficult thing of all. This is what it truly means to believe. That is to trust, meaning getting in that wheelbarrow and letting go and letting God take you not only through life, but through death into heaven. That's a very difficult thing to trust. That's why in John 14, Jesus says this, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in me. Trust also in my Father in heaven. In this class, we want to make sure you have knowledge of the Bible and whom the Bible proclaims as the only way to heaven, Jesus. In this class, we want to make sure that faith is growing in your heart. Faith is being sure of what you can't see, certain of the things that you have never laid your eyes on. But trust is one of the most important things. Who are you going to trust with your life? Who are you going to trust with your children? Who are you going to trust for the future? My prayer is that you'll trust Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, not only with your life, with your forgiveness, and with your salvation. He that believeth and is baptized will be saved. That's God's plan. I hope you know it. Would you bow your heads with me for a word of prayer? Father in heaven, I thank you for this time together. Yes, there is a golden rule, but it's not the way to heaven. Every religion on earth basically has a golden rule. Do your best to others the way you'd want them to treat you. But there's more than just the golden rule. There's a plan of salvation. And that plan of salvation is loving the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and your mind. That means knowing Him, having faith in Him, and trusting Him. And then that enables you to love others and to follow that golden rule. May we never forget this. May you be glorified in all we do. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen.